So hello and welcome to the video. I recently completed a seven night round UK cruise on Royal Caribbean's Anthem of the Seas. And you can see what I thought about that experience in this video right here. All brands aspire to differentiate themselves from the competition and it is no different in the cruising world. So I wanted to make a video about what I consider to be the six things that make the Royal Caribbean brand different from its competitors. Some will be obvious, some less so. And this is all my opinion. I have not researched Royal Caribbean's public strategy. All of this comes from my own observations. I've already done this for the celebrity brand in this video that you can find here. So if you'd like to see what I think about the Royal Caribbean brand, stick around. Hi, I'm Matt and I love cruising. I love the ships, the places you visit, the entertainment, and every now and again, I'll also enjoy a drink. So subscribe to see where I go next and perhaps get some inspiration for your next cruise. So as always, the usual disclaimer, I paid for my own cruise and Royal Caribbean did not know that I would be making videos about it. And if anyone from Royal Caribbean is watching, I'm really sorry about point five, although I do think it's valid. So the first and most obvious differentiator are the ships. The word you want to use is big, but you have to be a little bit careful. 17 of the world's 50 largest ships are operated by Royal Caribbean and they have all of the top four. But out of a 25 ship fleet, 18 of them aren't in this top 50 list and indeed eight of them are less than 100,000 tonnes. That's still pretty big if you're used to Fred Olsen Saga or the Isle of Wight Ferry, but in international cruise ship terms, those eight aren't huge. But the last 10 ships delivered to Royal Caribbean are all in this top 50 list, including the Anthem of the Seas, which is the one I recently sailed on. The five ships they have on order are all over 200,000 tonnes, which means that by 2026, Royal Caribbean could be operating the nine largest cruise ships afloat. So having bigger and bigger ships is clearly their strategy. As ships get bigger and bigger, the designers have two choices. Keep the mix of facilities the same, but just make everything bigger as the passenger load gets bigger, or add more stuff. Adding stuff increases the variety of what's on board, even if it means that the traditional venues don't grow in line with the growth in passengers. Royal Caribbean chooses to add stuff, which is great, but it does create a problem. On Anthem, with a full complement of 5,000 passengers on board, they will be competing for space in the venues, and some of them will end up disappointed. My favorite bar on any ship is a Royal Caribbean bar. But on Anthem, it only has about 150 seats, which is enough for just 3% of passengers. The main theatre has a capacity of 1,170. So on an average evening with a performer offering two shows, 53% of passengers won't be able to get a seat. In comparison, the Celebrity Silhouettes Theatre is only 55 seats smaller, on a ship with 41% fewer passengers. Which means that everyone on the Silhouette who wants to see a show ought to be able to. Royal Caribbean partially addresses this by having a booking system to secure seats at shows, but I would be furious if I had paid a significant chunk of money to cruise with Royal Caribbean and then was unable to see the headline shows. And having a booking system creates pressure to get your bookings in, and it removes spontaneity about how your evenings go because everything has to be planned in advance. Larger ships create another design challenge. Smaller ships tend to have grand foyers, which are vertical spaces where entertainers can perform and a sense of event can be created. This is impractical and is possibly even dangerous on larger ships with much larger passenger loads. So their congregational spaces are horizontal and it's called the Royal Esplanade on Anthem of the Seas. That makes the communal party experience feel more like something you'd experience on land. I'm thinking of Fremont Street in Las Vegas or Bourbon Street in New Orleans. And they tend to have these spaces in the middle of the ships so that are away from windows. And the larger ships have excellent stabilisation, so you rarely feel any motion when you're at sea. Basically, you forget you're on a ship, which I think is a real shame. If I'm on a cruise, I want to feel like I'm on a cruise. I want to see ropes. I want to see planks. I want to see the sea. 
The larger ships, in my humble opinion, feel like resorts that just happen to be on a ship, rather than ships that are also resorts. That may be great for you, I'm not sure I love it. So to point two, the entertainment, which is excellent. Unlike other brands, Royal Caribbean strictly prohibits filming of their shows, so I can't illustrate this in the way I perhaps would like to, although Graffiti Classics did encourage us to record this attempt to break the world record for playing The Flight of the Bumblebee. The headline offering on the anthem was We Will Rock You, the jukebox musical based on the works of Queen. This was, by a distance, the best thing I've ever seen on a ship. The other headline entertainers were all excellent. And even when the particular style of entertainment may not have been your cup of tea, you could certainly appreciate the talent and the quality of the performance. The larger Royal Caribbean ships also have a secondary performance venue. Anthems was called the 270. This offers 270 degree panoramic views of the sea when you're afloat and in the evening converts into a performance venue. Traditional entertainment will take place there, but there are also shows designed to take advantage of the venue's cutting edge technology. There are moving screens, moving platforms, holes in the ceiling from which aerialists drop, lots of clever stuff. It's a remarkable experience and it is clear that Royal Caribbean wants to use technology to create an experience for its customers that is unmatched. Point three is the food and beverage offering. The food is great, it is very well executed and I'm choosing my words quite carefully here. The dishes were probably a little bit less ambitious than you might see elsewhere. Lots of pork chops, curries and the like. But the dishes were very well executed and they were beautifully prepared and presented. The boat, or should that be ship, was pushed out a little on the two formal nights we had on a seven night cruise. Lobster made an appearance, but the range of formal night delights was perhaps a little bit narrower than you might see on other ships. The buffet offering was also excellent with lots of variety and I had no complaints at all and throughout all venues the service was excellent. Turning to beverages, the major strategic decision for Royal Caribbean is that no alcohol is included in your base fare. You can either pay as you go or buy the premium beverage package. This is the only booze package available and costs upward of 350 quid for seven nights. That's a challenging lump of change to pay for something as inessential as a few drinks. Of course, not including booze in the fare is great if you don't drink. You're not paying for something you won't use. And as this is a family oriented brand, I'd expect there would be a lot of passengers on board who aren't interested in drinking all day. The whole topic of drinks packages will get its own video shortly, but a lot of cruise lines these days include a basic drinks package in their base fare, so Royal Caribbean does differentiate itself by not doing so. The range of drinks available on board was good. There wasn't that much at the premium or luxury end, but you probably wouldn't expect there to have been. I've concluded that the price of individual drinks has been inflating over recent years to make the drinks packages look cheaper. I think they want you to buy the package. On Anthem you'd frequently pay about $12 for a cocktail which might only include one shot of alcohol. But where this really showed was with the wines, where some really quite mediocre wines were priced quite strongly. The Wolf Blast Merlot was £8.70 a glass and you can buy a whole bottle for seven quid quite widely. If you don't buy the package but still have the occasional drink, you might find yourself a little disappointed about paying so much for so little. The fourth differentiator links my points about venues, entertainment and drinks and it's the Schooner Bar. I think every Royal Caribbean ship has this bar and it's my favourite venue at sea. They feature a piano man. Ours had Daniel Marks. The entertainers have always been excellent, although I think Dan was the best I've ever seen. He needs a little help with the lyrics, but doesn't use any sheet music or notation to pound out the songs, and his repertoire is astonishing. His repertoire is constantly expanding too, as his aim is to learn five new songs a day. He's a remarkable talent. That's 
But I have to go back to the point about not feeling like you're on a ship. The schooner bar was quite heavily themed on older and smaller Royal Caribbean ships. But in the Anthem schooner bar, this small area of rigging is about the only nod to nauticality you can find. The bar itself was located right above the music hall venue, which was hugely over amplified so the schooner bar's floor vibrated to whatever was going on downstairs. All of which is a real shame because the schooner bar is a great venue with a hugely talented entertainer. And it was packed out every night and was one of the few venues to be so. It's still my favourite venue at sea, even if Royal Caribbean doesn't seem to look upon it as favourably as I do. Point five is a tricky one, but I detected stinginess on this and on previous cruises. Stinginess is a strong word, so let me give you three examples. Firstly, it's a small thing, but it's important to all of us. The toilet paper was awful. That sort of shiny single ply stuff that you know is cheap the second you touch it. It must be a conscious decision to buy cheap loo roll. And it's a complete false economy in my opinion because you just end up using twice as much of it. But it communicates something to customers that I don't think a brand committed to a premium experience should be communicating. The second is pool towels. You have to sign them in and out and are threatened with a $25 fine if you fail to return them. Now, I'd be surprised if the towels cost more than a couple of dollars each. So there's an inherent stinginess here in that Royal Caribbean doesn't want to buy decent pool towels. But they are also communicating that they distrust their customers. And it's another false economy. They need to build an entire system to administer it, which requires hardware, software and staff to operate it. It's not a premium experience, it's stingy, and it's insulting to the passengers. My third point was the most difficult one to explain and to script. I'll put it this way, I feel that Royal Caribbean underinvests in its staff. Now, given the ongoing challenges the crew face, the deprivations arising from their confinement on the ship, and the reduction in income they're experiencing as fewer passengers create a smaller tip pool, I cannot be even remotely critical of the staff on the Anthem of the Seas. They did a great job. But even before this cruise, I'd sensed that Royal Caribbean staff weren't quite as great as I've seen on other cruise lines. The best way to describe this is that it isn't a problem-solving culture. The staff are very mechanical in executing the procedures that they've been trained to apply. Problem-solving and initiative are higher-level skills that cost more, and I don't think Royal Caribbean are prepared to pay for those skills. I just don't feel that the staff are empowered to put the customer first in the way the staff are on other cruise lines. I'll stress that I'm not critical of Anthem's crew in any way. This is a point about Royal Caribbean's strategy and it's a view I've developed over my last few cruises with them. And finally, point six is about pricing, which really ties all of this together. In many ways, the Royal Caribbean experience is inferior to other brands. The food's great, but not quite as great as others. The drinks are great, but not quite as great as others. The staff are great, but are probably slightly less skilled than others. And there are areas where they demonstrate stinginess. Royal Caribbean excels with its facilities and its entertainment, but overall, I would expect them to cost a little bit less than their competitors. It would make sense for celebrity to be priced at a premium to Royal Caribbean to create an upgrade path for their customers. But Royal Caribbean isn't cheaper, it's quite the opposite. Here's an example. 11 nights cruising to the Canaries next September in a balcony cabin for two people on the Celebrity Silhouette costs £3,348. A 12 night cruise to the Canaries next September for two people in a balcony cabin on the Anthem of the Seas costs £10 more. It's one night longer, obviously, and this is just one example, but Celebrity's fare includes a premium drinks package, it includes Wi-Fi, and it includes the tips. The Royal Caribbean drinks package for a cruise that long could cost you six or seven hundred quid on top of this fare. The Wi-Fi might cost you another 150 quid. So whilst I would expect Royal Caribbean to be the cheaper offering, once you equalize out for these differences, they're actually about 30% more expensive. So how can Royal Caribbean justify this fare? Well, they obviously don't think they're the inferior offering. Looking at their facilities, they have a flow rider, they have an iFly, they have a North Star pod thingy on a big arm, all of which looked great. But your base fare only gives you limited opportunities to enjoy those experiences. 
to take full advantage of them, you need to pay again. I was keen on experiencing the North Star, but by the time I had worked out how to book it, all of the free slots had been taken. I then, perhaps stubbornly, refused to pay another $29 for something that I thought I'd already paid for. And their entertainment offering is superior, although half their guests won't get to see it. You pay a higher fare for the right to pay more when you're aboard to use the facilities, and you pay a higher fare to enter the lottery of getting to see their entertainment. So there you go. This was really complicated to script, and I think it's ended up being a bit long, but I really wanted to be clear with my points. At the end of the day, I'm just one bloke, and Royal Caribbean was comfortably filling its ships before the you-know-what came along, so I could be completely wrong. There are plenty of people who love the brand and will not cruise with anyone else. But I hope I have been clear and balanced and have empowered you to take a better decision if you're looking at cruise options. Your decision may very well be to cruise with Royal Caribbean, and if you do so, you will have an excellent time. Please leave me a comment as to what you think of all of this. In particular, have you recently sailed with Royal Caribbean and do you agree with me? Or have I got it all wrong? Throw the video a like too if you got something from it. And as always, please subscribe if you're new. So thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one. Goodbye. You're gone. You're gone.